Hello, 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 and welcome to another episode of the Hilaritas Podcast. I am your host, Mike Gathers. Join me here and now as we explore the vast world of a conic writer, psychedelic psychologist, rebel philosopher, and self-proclaimed agnostic mystic, Robert Anton Wilson. Visit us at hilaritaspress.com slash podcast for show notes, links, and past episodes. Right here... Right now, it is my great pleasure to share with you my chat with wizard, pagan, polyamorous, and so much more, Oberon Zell Ravenheart. Oberon Zell Ravenheart, welcome to the Heritage Podcast. So I know of you um, because... In um, roughly 1974 through 75, uh, Bob Wilson wrote about a dozen essays for Green Egg Magazine. He did. Yeah. And in fact, I think he wrote about another dozen letters to the editor starting before that and going on into maybe 1976 there. And um, the interesting time, that was when his star was really starting to shine. Illuminatus was uh, published, I believe, in that time frame. And he was engaged with his own uh, inner work around his serious stuff and talking with Timothy Leary about his starseed stuff. Just a lot going on. I'm wondering, did, did you know Robert Anton Wilson? Did you get to meet him? Or how did he come into your orbit as a... Uh, well, you were involved with Green Egg Magazine. I don't know what your position was at that time. Well, I was the founder and publisher and editor of the magazine um, starting in 1968. And uh, um, Bob and I actually met in person in Minneapolis. Um, uh, let's see, was that, I'm trying to remember whether it was in 73 or 74, but right, right in there. I had met my uh, life mate, Morning Glory, in the fall of 74 at the Gnostic Aquarian Convention in Minneapolis. It was sponsored by Llewellyn Publishing. And then we got married the following spring. And I don't remember. I think Bob was there for both of those. Uh, the first year when we actually met, uh, he did an interview with me for Playboy magazine. Oh. That he He'd gone there to do a story about the conference. Ended up having lunch together and doing an interview, which got published in the magazine, in Playboy. And then he was there the second time for um, for our marriage. It was a big deal. And we, we, we became very close friends and we shared water, became Water Brothers. And he became a regular contributor to Green Egg, which was my publication, which is sort of the inside journal of the emerging pagan community in that time. Okay, so you mentioned sharing water. Again, I just found out about you through Green Egg, and as I started doing a little research, there's just kind of more and more things opened up, so we'll get to <laughs> quite a, a variety of things, but since you mentioned sharing water, maybe you can tell us a little about that. Well, the initial inspiration for the Church of All Worlds, which is um, the organization that I founded in 62, had come from a science fiction novel by Robert Heinlein called Stranger in a Strange Land. There was very much a germinal piece of writing for that time. For, for 19, It was published in 1961 as the October uh, Science Fiction Book Club Selection of the Month. And it just had an enormous impact. It, it just cut across so many things. But it, it followed a decade of a dozen juvenile novels that I had written that people of my generation in the 50s grew up with, kind of like the Harry Potter generation today. You know, it was very much that same thing because all of the stories were for youth growing up and learning what it means to be fully human. They were very profound lessons. Wonderful stuff, and Heinlein was a great mentor, and this all culminated with Stranger in a Strange Land, which kind of wrapped it all up and took it to another whole level, and for the first time, 
in science fiction, we were introduced to um, thinking about sexuality and politics and and religion and you know and theology and and oh, just all kinds of stuff. It was really quite profound, had a huge impact, and the fundamental uh, theme, the way the story unwraps, is that the first human expedition to Mars crashes and everybody's killed, but a child that had been conceived on the journey, a, a, an infant, is discovered and raised by this indigenous race of ancient, you know, wise Martians that live underground that nobody knows about. And uh, 25 years later, because there have been a lot of conflicts on Earth in the meantime, another expedition that's successful goes to Mars and discovers this young man and brings him back to Earth, a world he's never known. And after extensive period in the hospitals, while he has to recover his being able to handle the gravity and atmosphere and everything else, he during this time, he kind of accumulates a following because his ideas and his philosophy and his training are so radical. And the way it's written, the reader becomes part of that following. Mm -hmm. It's very well done for that. You know, you kind of get wrapped into it. And as, as eventually he goes out into the world and is looking at everything we take for granted from a completely alien perspective, one which the reader is compelled to share. You know, we suddenly are like fish out of water looking back on the ocean that we've never, mm -hmm. never thought about, you know. And we it re-examines the feeling on just everything and uh, one of the essential elements of the well, and he, he ends up founding a new religion because the wise mentor in the story, who is basically Robert Heinlein's alter ego in the storyline, suggests that perhaps what they really should do is start a religion because, because of the First Amendment. Religion, he quotes, is a null area in the law. If you can establish a church and become a legal entity, you can pretty much do anything you want to do except for obvious criminal things, you know. So he does, and he follows a prescription. Well, it was a straightforward prescription, and we looked at that and said, well, we could do that. So we did, and the church that he founds is called the Church of All Worlds because it's meant to be comprehensive, taking wisdom from from all, all the face of the earth as well as from Mars or whatever else, you know, basically meant to be a universal church. And the central ritual of this is the sharing of water, because water is quite precious on Mars, very rare. And so to share water with someone is to acknowledge a kinship that is, is deep and profound. And to do that with the context of becoming water brothers or, or sisters with someone is kind of like a marriage of, of you know? mm. And it becomes kind of a lifelong commitment. The saying is sort of like water is thicker than blood, you know. Right. But that's, that's basically it. So, so we shared well, during those during those years and continue to this day. And Bob was one of those. And that feeling, that connection of becoming Water Brothers with somebody, is a lifelong thing and very profound and very deep. And that's basically. The gist of it, the church have all evolved <laughs> and changed and shifted and grown decades, of course, but it's still a very strong factor. In 1967, when we became public with it first time, somebody asked a fateful question. They said, well, what kind of religion is this? Are you some kind of a Christian sect? Are you one of these Eastern things? Because, you know, funny religions were coming out of the woodwork back in the, in the at that time. You know, we got the you know, the uh, Krishna people and the Moonies and the Scientologists, everybody was coming out with all these new religions. So they asked, it was a fair question. And I'd kind of grown up on mythology and folklore. So I said, well, I guess you can say we're pagans. So it was. And I was the first person apparently ever recorded to have claimed to actually be pagan because prior to that time, pagan was used to refer to other people in a kind of derogatory sense. Ah, right. Those pagans, it was always those pagans. We got to send the missionaries out to convert those pagans, you know. <laughs> they, they always, those pagans, they do weird stuff. But nobody ever said, we are pagans, us pagans, and I did. And then I would hear about other groups around. I would hear about some people doing, you know, perhaps looking into Druidic, Egyptian or Greek stuff, and and I would hear about these. I, I, and at that time, I was publishing this little newsletter, green egg that was just really meant to say who we are and what we're about 
And I would send it to these guys and say, you guys sound like pagans and we're pagans. Let's all be pagans together. La-di-da. And folks would say, yeah, pagans, that's that's what we are. We're all pagans. And out of that grew a pagan movement, which has become huge, a, mm. a vast movement, global. And it's really pretty cool. That that uh, pagan positivism. I love it. Yep. So that's funny. It was used almost like a slur prior to you. And you, you more or less took ownership of it at that moment, it sounds like. How would you define pagan? Well, there's several ways of looking at it. Um, traditionally, in the dictionary, pagan is basically uh, non-Abrahamic, pretty mm. much. All religions that are pre- and non-Abrahamic are considered pagan. That would be Hinduism, indigenous religions of all cultures, um, Shinto, Taoism. Not, not Buddhism, technically, because it's, um, it's mm. a kind of a thing all to itself, more of a philosophy, but but pretty much everybody that's not Judeo-Christian Islamic, according to the dictionary, is considered pagan. Mm. And, and that's okay. Uh, one of the uh, kind of terms is like refers to the old religion, the, the pre-Abrahamic uh, religion. And that works. Uh, paganism is based on nature. It's also called nature religion or nature mm. worship. It's very much connected with the seasons of the year and of the earth. Um, the theology is animist and pantheist. It's very much that divinity is within everything and everybody. The In the book, this is expressed by the phrase, thou art God, which is really quite profound and, and very Hindu, actually, in many ways. It's a very Hindu way of looking at it, which is also very pagan by definition. It embraces polytheism. The most radical things that it embraces feminine as well as masculine concepts of divinity. So we have not just gods, but goddesses as well, and very much a focus on the earth, on Gaia, as the goddess, the great mother. Is a book I wrote on that subject, Gaia Genesis, about the, the living earth. And I'm the one who first formulated and published that idea that has become the Gaia thesis that's widely known now, very widespread. And I can claim that first authorship of that one. I so that, that's kind of what it's about. You know, we're all about uh, being connected with the earth, not being superior over it, not trying to dominate the world, but be part of it and get along. Got it. And even I was asking you about paganism and you, well, I guess that was part of the, the church of all worlds, but I love how you, you did tie that back to Heinlein and uh, thou art God. Um, right. So it, it's, I, I hadn't, made the connection between Heinlein and paganism until you were talking just there, but it all came full circle to me. Well, here's another one. In Heinlein's Strange in a Strange Land, in the Church of All Worlds, they have priestesses. And priestesses are only found in religions. No, no Abrahamic religions have priestesses. So that's another little piece of it. There. Oh, right. A little pagan. Wow. Quite the... And in the book, does he specifically... Um, use Church of All Worlds, or is that something you came up with? No, no, that was the name of it in the book. In the we book. Did. So he pretty much book. gave you the formula there, and you actually took it and manifested it into reality. Yep, we took it and ran with it. And I corresponded with Heinlein for many years, too. We had a nice personal correspondence and 40-some pages of it. Some When I got it all put together and organized, it was really quite Quite nice. Very, very significant. And from then on, of course, his other books took these ideas and kept on going with them. And we kept on going with the Church of All Worlds and um, and the pagan movement. The whole pagan movement grew out of all that. Right. And and you mentioned Gaia. Um, you were you were doing that before James Lovelock, as I as you yeah, mentioned. About about three years before. Now, I also corresponded with Lovelock for years when. When he came out with his stuff, we corresponded, and all of our correspondence is in the book. Oh, great. You know, a whole appendix of correspondence with Lovelock and all kinds of other cool stuff. I'm, I'm uh, continually uh, soaking in all the dimensions of Oberon Zell Ravenheart, so <laughs> bear with me. This well, is fabulous. I've been around a while. I've been busy. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have been busy. 
Well, so, and I mentioned how you kind of manifested this in the universe and you, you kind of hinted at a few things that made me think about wizardry, which is another direction that ties into all this, but yet it's its own thing in your world, at least the way I, I see it. Can you talk about wizardry and how that fits into your world? Well, sure. I mean, you know, that's kind of basic. Um, wizardry, wiz it means wisdom, basically. That's what it mm. means, literally. And um, there are many different variations of that through the ages. Philosophy, for example, means love of wisdom. So in ancient Greece, people we would call wizards today were called philosophers. In the Orient, they were called sages. And, um, and in the Middle East, it was mages, magi, you know, as in the Bible story about the magi coming to visit Jesus. Their wizardry is, is ancient and, and deep because... Wizards tended to write books, and they tended to write. Uh, they were the first people to formulate uh, mathematics and geology, geometry, geology, architecture, agriculture, all kinds of things. And they wrote books about these things. So we have this medicine. But the first fully recorded wizard is probably Imhotep from ancient Egypt, who was um, the court wizard and advisor to three successive pharaohs and the designer of the first known pyramid the um, step pyramid mm. in legend as the living mummy in the movies but it's kind of weird if i could come back today and say it you kind of wonder how did they do that but um you know uh, merlin of course is kind of an archetypal example of the classic wizard but a wizard is not a religious figure with the co modern corollary is probably professor you know it, it does not define what religion somebody was. It defines their who they are. They're, they're somebody who knows stuff that people come to for advice and counsel. And, um, and, they, and their main Merlin or Obi-Wan Kenobi or Gandalf is to be a mentor to the young heroes. So wizards set up the first um, known mystery schools, people like Archimedes and Pythagoras and Plato set up their academies came some of the first teachers that, that did that. So, and we have that, we have, we have the books, we have the teachings, we have the history. It's, it's very, very well documented all the way through. Well, I eventually got to that place um, as well, where people kept coming to me for advice and counsel. And, you know, you don't really decide to be a wizard exactly, you know, all mm -hmm. about today people probably are, but, uh, Normally, it's just that people start referring to you as the wizard, you know, is how it kind of comes about. You know, oh, he's the wizard, you know, go talk to him. He knows stuff. Eventually, I got convinced to write a book about this stuff. So I, I was like in my 60s before I wrote my first book, which was a Grimoire for the Apprentice Wizard, kind of a Boy Scout handbook for, for young wizards to the whole Harry Potter phenomenon. I figured, well, you know, there's all this fictional fantasy stuff that's become very popular. Maybe you should put out a book about the real thing. Mm. And a publisher approached me and asked me to do that. So I said, okay. And I did. It became a huge instant hit, still a bestseller. And it, it persuaded me that, well, that's kind of a textbook. It, so I should probably have a school to, to use it. So I founded a school, of the Gray School of Wizardry. And it's been going now for 20 years. It's online mostly, but we do have a physical campus in Whitehall, New York. Now we've got a couple dozen uh, faculty members and currently, as of this morning, uh, 250 students, 16 departments at seven levels. And it's a um, great school, really great school. Wow. Can you, you mentioned a physical campus. I find that interesting. So are there actually classes being taught in, in the real world, so to speak? Yes, there are. In addition to the online stuff, which is global, of course, people can plug into the online school anywhere. And we have a, a virtual campus in Second Life, but we have a physical campus now with classrooms and dormitories so that people can, you know, actually come and take classes. Currently, um, we tend to have special sessions because mm -hmm. it's really kind of hard to do that all around i mean you'd have to have a full-scale staff to maintain that so we tend to have um special weekend or longer uh seminars that's pretty much the way it works on physical okay that's a great way to mix uh some 
some real world uh, interaction with uh, the online academy. That's the, it very, is very neat. Well, I was the I was the founder and headmaster for for many many years, and last year I did a formal ceremony of passing the torch to my protege Nicholas Kingsley, who now carries the fourth as headmaster. I still I'm still part of the school. I still teach classes and stuff, but. But um, I don't have the responsibility of being headmaster anymore, and he does. Gotcha. And so, is there? Um, in my, my my imagination is there's a bunch of different influences that go into wizardry versus uh, you had the the strangers of strange land kind of gave you the formula for the Church of All Worlds. What would you say some of the major influences on the Gray School of Wizardry are? Well, um, kind of a lifeline. St- lifelong study of metaphysical subjects and you know weird science and um and, and just a lot of interesting stuff the departments uh, encompass everything from psychic arts to um herbalism to animal stuff cosmology um healing lore storytelling performance um there, it, it covers a lot of territory basically wisdom teachings the wisdom of the ages is gotcha. what it's all and a lot, I would say, from what I saw, the majority of it is is nature based or, or has that very kind of pagan nature feel to it. But I want to say there might have been a chapter on techno wizardry or something of that nature. There is, there is, there's a department of techno wizardry because uh, that's also wizardry. And um, well, one of the things I'm pleased with is that our students are not just pagans. We have students coming from all different religious backgrounds because, again, wizardry is not a religious thing. It's like mm, uh. being a professor, you know, that doesn't define it. And we have Christians and Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus and pagans and just all kinds of folks. And they get along just great. We have wonderful discussions and we have a great campus uh, newsletter called Gray Matters. And um, it's 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 wonderful. I'm very pleased. It got amazing quality of students. That's really really neat. And so one of my notes here, I don't think this is a direct quote really, but is that uh, myth and storytelling shapes the future. And I think that I wrote that under wizardry, and it sounds to me like a wizard shapes his destiny in a way by the way he tells his story. Is that accurate? His or her that story. Is- that is absolutely accurate and very, very authentic. You know, we are beings of story. Our our true immortality is in stories. You know, we're still telling stories about people who lived thousands of years ago. We tell the stories of Jason and the Argonauts and Heracles and Arthur and in Robin Hood, you know, and all those things. Um, if we live our lives to make good enough stories, then hopefully people will continue telling about us in the future and our memory will live on. We have a, a little saying, which we often evoke at funerals, that is, what is remembered lives. And that's that's very much of it. But, but stories, yeah, we are the storytellers, mm. the creators of the stories, and the stories shape us, you know, as well as we shape them. And that's a powerful magic. It's a one that anybody can play, you know. Anybody can write a story. I mean, think of the whole Harry Potter stories. But But all the great religions are stories. You know, that's in all of this, all, everything that we do and believe and the actions we take and the and the wars we make are all based on stories. I think it was Joseph Campbell that suggested that one of the uh, troubles of, of modern times is we don't have a good myth to fit what's going on for us. Uh, Precisely. When, is there something you recommend? The <laughs> Gaia Genesis. Is, am I pronouncing it that right? Do you... That's right. Gaia Genesis. I really feel that the story that we need to be promoting now, and Joseph Campbell said as much. He actually said um, specifically that the only myth, here I can read it, the only myth that is going to be worth thinking about in the immediate future is one that is talking about the planet and mm-hmm. everybody else. This might be the symbol, really, for the new mythology to come. That's the first quote at the top of the page of the book you know wow well, there it is so really uh how would you describe that then is this a, a return to nature 
you know, I mean, nature's obviously always been there. <laughs> you know, it hasn't <laughs> gone away, although we're doing the best we can to drive it away, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's it's a matter of returning the natural values to mm. think of how often we invoke the concept of Mother Nature. You know, I mean, I remember as a kid, the, the Disney would have their true life specials and they would start off by saying, in the fall, Mother Nature paints the, car the trees with glorious colors and things like that. You know, Mother Nature is the most universal archetype at all. And, and the, the picture on the cover of this is of a statue that I created called the Millennial Gaia. And it is hugely popular. I mean, I don't know how many thousands and thousands of these have, have been created and are put out there. It's currently marketed by Pacific Trading Company, which is the largest company producing statuary. They're everywhere in stores and everything in different sizes and all. Um, did you sculpt that yourself? Yes, I did. Uh, back did. in 1980, uh, That's a beautiful image. I didn't realize that was an actual sculpture, but it did seem familiar to me like I'd maybe seen it before. Well, I would hope so. She's. I remember during um, the presidential election when Al Gore for president, I saw an interview with him on ABC in his office in the White House, and there was my statue sitting on his desk. So I was pretty tickled by that. You wow. Know? Very nice. So, so I, I think the idea, of course, is, is that we are all part of one vast living organism, that the entire biosphere of the Earth is not a bunch of separate organisms, but one single biological entity. All of life on Earth shares the same DNA and protoplasm that um, can be traced back to the Cambrian explosion half a billion years ago. And we all share it. And we are this, we are all part of one organism the same way that all the cells in our body are part of one organism, all deriving from one original fertilized cell that begins our existence as an individual. And that fertilization uh, on the earth occurred a half a billion years ago. Since that point, the entire life of the planet is one continual biological organism. This is not a fairy tale or a myth or a story. It's a biological reality. But the thing is, when you have an organism, no matter how large or how small, it is accompanied by, by um, sentience. You know, you don't have non-sentience in any living organism. And the sentience on a planetary scale is what we've always referred to as Mother Earth or Mother Nature, it's a thing, or uh, in contemporary parlance, the goddess, you know, mm. and part of that, we are cells in the body, and we are all children of the same mother, and if we can understand that, and if that becomes a story, and it is, it's becoming wider and wider spread everywhere, down in South America, a growing movement among indigenous people is what they call the Pachamama Alliance, and Pachamama literally means Earth Mother, that's <laughs> That's the word. And this is becoming a theme that is uniting people all over the world. The idea we are all children of the same mother is a profound myth and, and a very deep one. And it's based in reality. So there we go. Yeah. Wow. I'd have to say uh, something just shifted for me right there. You know, we hear this, we're all one. And, you know, I've had that intuitive experience. I've had that psychedelic experience. But when you put it in the framework of Gaia and how we're all interconnected on this one mothership living organism, that, that gave me a new perspective just now. Thank you for that. Well, so, and that is precisely the reaction that everybody has had every time they've been confronted with that since it first hit me back in 1970. You know, it was my, the vision I had, but I spread it. I've written about it. I've talked about it. I've sculpted statues, done art. And that's the reaction that people always have is, is, wow, that's transformative. That puts things in a whole new perspective. Yeah, it really puts a more concrete image to the we are all one motif, I guess I'll call it. And uh, that was really neat. So when you say nature's values, that we need to go towards nature's values, is that the main value then that we're all one as a part of this? mother Gaia organism. 
is um, there is uh, there is a factor that, you, for example, that unites all pagan traditions throughout the world, um, no matter what culture or continent they come from. And that's what we call the wheel of the year. And that's the cycle of seasonal celebrations that are based on the solstices and the equinox, the quarter days falling halfway between them. So there's eight of these. And everybody, all pagan cultures, celebrate them in one sense or another. And they even, uh, if you find echoes of them even in the Abrahamic religions, especially in Christianity, where the celebrations of Easter, for example, which is spring equinox, really, is full of things like, you know, eggs and bunnies, which don't really have anything to do with Jesus, but have a lot to do with the time of fertility, with the celebration of the mm-hmm. new birth. Or the winter solstice celebrations, you know, that we have, that the holiday customs that we all are familiar with, these are all developed from winter solstice. It's all about winter solstice, really, the Feast of Lights, returning, bringing the sun back at the darkest time. You know, we have Halloween, we have May Day, we have all of these. These are all connected to these ancient and universal celebrations of the turning of the year. And the pagans don't celebrate you know, the birth or death of heroes or martyrs or prophets or anything like that. That's that's just ephemeral stuff that passes. But we all celebrate the turning of the year and the great cycles of the seasons. Wow. Okay. So you have the the equinoxes and the solstices, and then you put four more divisions in there to create eight phases. And, and that rang a bell for me because I, I believe Green Egg is published on those eight phases. Um, that's right yeah so this yeah this universal universal tracking of the earth and the sun together right make up the the seasons and the phases and what can we learn what are the natural values we can learn from that eight phase cycle i guess you, you touched on it but well the the cycle can be seen as a macrocosm of the microcosm of our own lives i mean there's a time of birth there's the time of of growth and fulfillment, the you know spring equinox is the time of birth, and Beltane May the May Day is the time of sexuality, you know, mm. and the summer solstice, which is the time of of expansion, and get the three harvest festivals: the first of August, Lunasad, and fall equinox we call Mabon in September, and then of course um, Samhain or Halloween which is the, the final harvest and the festival of the dead. Um, and we honor the ancestors and we track our own lives in these kind of cycles. These the, We relate to these. And if we're celebrating this in the turning of life on the earth and the, the growth of the vegetation, the life cycle of the animals, you know, our own lives, it connects us. And we realize that we are not separate and disconnected. I think in many ways, the great uh, problem with humanity is our sense of alienation is connected. I, I think you, there's something big there, right? So a connection of kind of the rhythms and cycles of the planet and the day and the stars and the and, and life. We certainly, um, our technological culture is abstracted pretty far from, from everyday mundane celestial, I hate to say mundane, but right there in front of us, reality. Well, goodness. Is there anything else we can take when we, we go back? A return to natural values, a return to Mother Nature, and honoring of of kind of the cycle of cycles of life and the rhythms of life and death and birth. Uh, is there anything more? Well, I think today one of the more important things that we need to take from this, in addition to all of that, is the concept of diversity. Mm. Life to flourish is based on diversity, not uniformity. I, I think of this metaphor, you know, um, t- take any big city and every cultural in the world comes in there and they open restaurants, you know. So you go to a big city and you've got the possibility of, of every kind of cuisine you can imagine. And it's amazing how how diverse people can come up with ways of preparing wonderful food. And, you know, there's no conflict there. There's no idea there should be only one restaurant, you know, we should all be eating, you know, you know, steak and potatoes, you know, when there's Chinese food and Japanese cuisine and Vietnamese and a million others all there. And I think that's the way we should in culture. We should not be trying to eradicate or destroy or make war on different cultures. We should appreciate this diversity, both on the cultural level and on the personal level. 
the idea that each person is a unique, amazing entity, but all of those together, each each thread, you know, comes in together to make a beautiful tapestry. You don't have a right. tapestry with only one colored thread. That would be stupid. You want lots and lots of different colors to join in the tapestry and to weave a beautiful image that keeps on growing. And I think we need to absorb that and learn that. And I'm really pleased that that the ongoing cultural mythos, I mean, we started storytelling just around the campfire, you know, and it grew into myths and legends. And today we see this reflected in movies and TV shows and series. And I pay a lot of attention to how these reflect the culture like Joseph Campbell did. This is our current mythology. This is the way we tell the stories. And I really appreciate that the stories that are being told these days are full of cherishing diversity of all mm. kinds. The characters are not guys, you know. You know, There's a lot of good diversity being represented. And the more, the better. You know, look at all the Disney um, animated films that take place with different cultures and peoples all over the world. This is the kind of thing I think we need to cherish that will carry us forward because we can no longer afford the isolation that the monotheistic religions have forced upon their people, that we are the one true right and only way and everybody else is out is wrong because they're not right. And if they're wrong, then they're bad. And if they're bad, then they should be punished and you know, maybe exterminated. You know, And that, I'd say, the intrinsic evil that has been inflicted upon the world is the concept of monotheism. This one true right and only way that has no room for anybody or anything else. So taking away the lesson of diversity is important. Mm. And another one of these values, as I alluded to earlier on, you know, since only pagan religions have priestesses, is empowering women and bringing the women back into the core of this whole thing. We need, we need to do that. And we are. And it's wonderful to see that happening because it's transformative for a thousand years the monotheistic churches have waged a, a war on women. You know, the, the gynophobia, the misogyny of the great monotheistic religions has been horrific. The, the tortures and, and, and murder that have been inflicted upon women has been just ghastly just for being women because the, the patriarchal guys who are running these shows are terrified of women and women's power. Their, their sexuality, their ability to bring new life into the world, the fact that they are the teachers of the children can raise the kids with their values. You know, you've got cultures now that absolutely are fanatically trying to prohibit women from um, learning to read even, you know, let alone have any power or influence. So that's another thing I think that we bring to this, this empowerment of women, the valuing, the cherishing of that, both on the personal level as well as on the theological level, bringing, returning to the goddess, not just the sole solitary godhead, but, but you know, a female divinity as well. So, yeah, these are some of the pagan values, I, I think, that can offer a lot to the world. Is it about empowering women or giving women the space to empower themselves? Well, I think the latter really is what it's really about. If they get the space to do it, they'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine, you know. They don't need us to do it for them, but we need to get out of the way, you know? That That's a big deal. It's, it sounds simple, but I think that getting out of the way is, is a lot harder than we realize. I don't want to lose track of the empowering women theme, but you mentioned diversity, and the word that came up for me is interdependence. And yeah. when you mentioned the tapestry, and I think that really illustrates the idea of interdependence and how they all come together to form all these different strands of thread come together to form one one uh, gestalt so to speak one object absolutely i didn't mean to challenge you on the women thing i just um oh, wanted to I, make that I, little, I, little little note there I heard i'm with wife, you <laughs> i heard my wife's voice in my ear uh, just get out of the way yes. Well, you know, one thing that women always say when they're asked about what they want most from men is they want them to listen. Mm. I think the lower case of men, what men they do is to, you know, sit down and shut up and and let the women have it. Oh, yeah, that classic paradigm, I think, of the man wants to fix and the woman's like, no, just just listen. Well, maybe that brings up our next subject we haven't really touched on, um, polyamory. 
Where do we go? <laughs> your your uh, wife, Morning Glory, primary partner. Is that a fair? Life, wife, life mate, um, primary everything. Um, yeah. Mate. We had 40 years together before she died of cancer, and that was uh, that was over nine years ago. And um, I have just recently become engaged. Oh. So I'm very, very excited about having a wonderful new lady in my life because um, Lori and I were an amazing couple, absolutely amazing. It was practically one, you know, over on the morning glory. It was like one word. Yeah. And like um, teasing carrots. Yep. Yeah. Pretty much. And it was an amazing thing and very, very difficult for me to continue. Her dying words were, don't let it die. No. Oh. And, um, and so I've kind of tried to carry on without her, but our work and everything that we did was designed to be done by a couple, not designed to be done by one person. And I feel like someone who's had a leg amputated and trying to dance. And it's a little awkward, you know. Well, and I'm glad to hear that, that it seems like that's uh, moving into its next phase for you. So you're, you're getting yeah. there, yeah, engaged. Excellent. And Morning Glory coined the term polyamory. I was surprised that didn't happen until 1990. You know, we were just doing it. Now, another That's another element in Strange and Restrange Land is um, what we would call polyamory as, as people sharing their lives and uh, and sexuality in a very positive, loving, non-jealous, non-possessive fashion of um, kind of, you know, forming what they called nests in the story. They were kind of like a group marriage uh, as much as anything. And um, in a long discussion in the book, Heinlein came up with an absolutely brilliant statement that I think was also unique and profound. It was a definition of love as that condition wherein another person's happiness is essential to your own. So love, instead of being something about how you feel, it becomes directed for the other person, you know, wanting them to be happy and doing what you can to make that happen. And you can expand on that to fulfillment and empowerment and all kinds of things, but that's the core of it. And when you adopt that framework, it pretty much eliminates the jealousy and all the crazy stuff. And, you know, we'd sit and watch TV shows or movies that the whole theme would be around the plus triangle kind of a thing, you know, half the crimes that go on are based on that. It's crazy. So just been living that way. We had had what they would call in those days an open marriage, but it was a little more than that. We, we are closely bonded with other people that we came a part of our lives, part of our family. And, you know, sometimes we slept together and, and, you know, we'd have dinner together. We'd be on projects together. And, um, one day, Morning Glory was mentioning about some other couple that was really screwing up with trying to have an open marriage, you know, and, and doing it by running around behind each other's back and cheating and stuff. And she made some comment about, well, they're just not following the rules. Hmm. And at that time, our, our third partner, Diane, said, you know, you're always talking about these rules. Why don't you write an article about that for Green Egg? So at that time, we had uh, four adults and three kids in our in our family and we were publishing in the 90s we were publishing green egg and a spectacular you know color covers newsstand publication version and and you know raising unicorns and doing all kinds of cool stuff together so morning glory wrote the article and she needed to come up with a word to describe what we, we were talking about because the words using gammy that means marriage so when you talk about polygamy or anything that way that is a reference to marriage. We weren't talking about people getting married. We were talking about people having multiple lovers, but in an okay way that everybody was okay with that and just fine with that. So, you know, so we tossed around some of the words in Latin and Greek with each other. And um, after trying out words like um, polyphilia, which sounds like a disease, or <laughs> pedophilia, <laughs> sounds awkward, right? None of those really worked until she clicked the Greek and Latin together and came up with polyamory. And suddenly that just clicked and we started using it and she put it in the article and people picked it up and it caught on and became a movement. And now it's huge, huge movement. You know, there's, I've seen TV documentaries that say, well, we got about 500,000 people in America that are, 
you know, living polyamorous lifestyles. You know, I'm seeing the term appearing in dramas and in movies and all kinds of stuff. It's really cool. Yeah, it's, I mean, again, I was shocked that it wasn't coined until 1990 because it's pretty ubiquitous now. It is. And and I've I heard that story and I wanted to find the uh, the article that she wrote with the rules for polyamory and I I was unsuccessful. Um, oh, it's, it's called Bouquet of Lovers. And okay. If you just Google it, you'll find it because it's reprinted all over Glorizel, 1990. I wonder if you could talk a little about that because polyamory is uh, it, it it's either come out. To where it's more talked about now or just become more popular or both but in my experience there's maybe two different types of people that explore polyamory one is is sort of a more mature person that's just looking to engage in a diversity of deep emotionally intimate relationships and it sometimes it seems like there's folks that are really they struggle to be in one relationship and they alleviate that by being in many but what happens is they're in none. It does require, I think, a, a certain degree of depth and maturity and sophistication. The fundamental rule and principle is is honesty. Mm. You know, it's, it's all based on that. And in, and the principles and rules, as Morning Glory wrote them in her article, are really those who are in uh, that you know uh, definition of love, caring about your partner's feelings more if that's your focus, not your own feelings. And when you apply those then how many people you can love opens up. It expands, mm. you know, uh, as we say, um, you know, love shared is love multiplied, you know, and if you have a love as powerful and deep as Morning Glory and I had, it's a lot of spillover. There's plenty to share, you know, it's not a problem. It, but it also requires a sense of security and, and self-confidence and all that stuff. It doesn't really work for people who are shallow and insecure and, sneaky and dishonest and they're just you know looking for some way to cheat and not get caught that's not what it's about it's it's much more profound than that you know and i'm sorry if that doesn't work for everybody but you but that's not what it's meant it's not meant to be for everybody you know it's meant for people who can do this there's something that that overarching rule of where you're caring for the other person and, and the the fine line to me is 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 uh where you might lose track of yourself. And and so what I'm hearing is you, you have to have a certain amount of self-development so that you can focus your energy on another without losing track of yourself. Is that? Absolutely. You really have to have your own together before you can really take on something like this. You know, I, I tell people just, just, you know, get yourself in a place first where you're solid and you're confident and you're capable and, um, competent you know in all ways maybe try on something a little bit beyond what you've done before and so is there a way to um step into it slowly so to speak polyamory any relationship with uh, complete openness honesty and integrity you know and you really are truly devoted to the other person rather than just your own mm. self-satisfaction um, and you really get to that kind of relationship, then you can consider whether, you know, you can open it up a little bit or expand it. But it doesn't, I, I don't think that it works by deciding you want to have an expanded relationship. The way it works is you've got a good solid relationship and that's attractive. And you meet somebody who seems to be really drawn to that relationship and care about the people, you know, and you bring them in. You know, they, they come home to meet the family. Morning Glory and I travel a lot. We did talks and workshops and travel all over the world, not always together, because sometimes the people who are bringing us can only afford to fly one of us out there. And we would often meet other people on our journeys that we would think, wow, this is, person is really, really cool. And so the next thing was in our mind, well, let's bring them back home and see how they get along, you know? Mm. I think one of the key lessons, most important relationship in a polydynamic is not the, the two people who connect, it's how they connect with the other partners, you know? And if that works, you know, if, if I can go out to a festival and meet some wonderful woman and bring her back home to meet my partner and they hit it off, we can work with this. 
And that's how it's worked. And over that time, we built up two successive group marriages of 10 years duration in each case and still have, you know, deep connections. I mean, the kids that we raised are still brothers and sisters to each other and still connect deeply, you know, and all of the partners that we, you know, collected over that time, which was not vast numbers, you know, but the really solid ones are still connected with each other and still love each other and care about each other and so on. Some have died. Morning Glory died. My son died. But forming those kind of relationships, it's 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 not a bad thing to do with your life, you know? I see. I, I like how you describe it as kind of like a progression where it just kind of expands outward. Yep. Uh, out of curiosity, so when you were on the road meeting people and bringing them back home to uh, meet the family, what was the the compatibility, the success rate, so to speak, where if that makes sense? It was was it, I, I imagine it's not for everyone, so that nobody knew who I was. You know, that wasn't at all. They would always know, and they would be people who'd be drawn to this kind of thinking in this way. So it would generally have a pretty good start in the first place. So I really wouldn't connect with somebody who didn't have that really. And so that was, there were, there was kind of an entrance exam kind of thing, you know, and generally the connections went really well. There was only a couple of times in our lives that we connected with somebody and brought them home and it yeah, did not connect well. And we just said, well, that didn't work. And there were, oh, and, and for many of them, they just remained on a good friendship basis and somebody would be a good, connection and good lover. And we had some of those that went back decades, but they didn't qualify to live together to become part of the Ravenheart clan. You know, that was really very few people at that level, but that's true in general. I mean, finding, a, you can find lots of lovers, you know, that's easy, but finding somebody you can actually live with and build a life together as a partner, it's another whole thing. And yeah. I, I think I'm pretty fortunate to have found several life partners during those years, during all those years we've had together that uh, did in fact connect. And that's, and we were amazing, amazing team to do stuff. I mean, it sounds not that much different from friendship in a way where you have very close, intimate friends and you have people that are acquaintances and everywhere in between. That's right. That's exactly right. It's just that there's another hole into this a little bit closer in, yeah. Just think of these concentric circles, you know, you got yourself in the middle and then concentric circles of relationships expanding outward. Well, I, I, I certainly love hearing you talking about it and, and, and seeing how well it, it worked for you. It's very inspiring compared to some of the stories I've heard. But so it goes. I wanted to ask you to go back to Green Egg. So Wilson was was pretty engaged in, in so it's called 73 to 76, wrote about a dozen letters and a dozen essays. And, and some of those essays are excellent. They made it into his book, uh, The Illuminati Papers. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you published one in kind of a best of book, Green Egg Omelette. And uh, as I said, it was really when he just, his star started to take off and shine brightly and, and maybe the beginning of his, like a 10-year renaissance of, of Wilson. But um, one thing I was just fascinated by is uh, he wrote an obituary for Robert Shea in 1994, and uh, that got published in Green Egg, which he hadn't been active in, in 20 years. It seems like Robert Anton Wilson obituary on Robert Shea could have been published about anywhere he wanted. Uh, is there a story there on how it became published in Green Egg? I don't think anything particular. I mean, he was a regular part of our Green Egg family. Okay. You know? When Morning Glory and I in, in the Church of All Worlds in its early days was based in St. Louis from the early 60s through the 70s. And then we relocated to California in the mid 70s. And um, a lot of stuff we just weren't able to handle. We ended up raising unicorns during that, during the 80s and stuff. And it wasn't until the late 80s that we were able to turn our attention back to Green Egg. In the meantime, the people who had been carrying it on, it kind of just sort of fizzled out. You know, they weren't able to keep it going. So there was a, about an eight or nine year hiatus there that the magazine wasn't being published. But then we got together with Diane and formed our new group marriage family. And, uh, in, and in 1988, we said, let's uh, come back with Green Egg again. By that time, Desktop Publishing had come out and were 
new computers were able to do much more sophisticated stuff than we could do on the old typewriter, you know, and uh, it seemed like time. So we did. And we, uh, we called the first issue Green Egg Generation because the Star Trek Next Generation had mm-hmm. also just come out. And so that was how we felt. And we had gone for a couple of years, started in 88. And we connected with all of our old friends and people who had contributed before and started publishing stuff. And Bob was one of those. And, and he sent us that. That, that was all. It was just a, a, a revival, as it were. And the magazine continues now online. So it's now, you know, greeneggmagazine.com online. Excellent. Well, yeah. I think you said it all in a way when you said it, that we're all like family. So to the extent that he had this obituary he wanted to publish for an old friend, going back to the family to publish it makes a lot of sense. That uh, tells me how close he felt to you and your community. Was was Bob Shea in that circle with you? Did you know Bob Shea? I'm not, I didn't know him, but uh, we knew his wife really well. Okay, you know, you know and uh, that was a, that was an interesting old thing. But really, never did know, get to know Bob Shea at that time. We weren't living in the neighborhood, really. You know, gotcha. And, uh, did you knew often. Patricia from another. Yeah, we knew her, and we were very connected with her. We did a lot of stuff together, and in writing together projects and in, in goddess presentation stuff that was, but it was just with Patricia. Of course, they're all dead now. So, you know, it's, it's kind of strange. All these people who were so important part of our lives are no longer on this side of the grass. It feels weird to me. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and sharp as ever. Uh, it's been well, great chatting with you. We haven't even gotten into mermaids and unicorns. <laughs> Do we, should we go there? You want to talk about unicorns real quick? Sure, if you want. Um, whatever you want to talk about, I'm happy to talk about it. Okay. Well, I, I found it interesting because I my parents would have taken me to the Texas Renaissance Fair in the probably the late 70s, early 80s. And I don't know that we would have crossed paths per se, but you and, and Morning Glory were bringing these unicorns you had raised to Renaissance fairs or somewhere in that time frame. Um, so you, uh, well, maybe I'll just let you tell the story. You were into magical beasts and... Well, when Morning Glory and I first got together and started comparing notes on our lives, we had so many things in common. It was really pretty amazing. In fact, when we met, we were actually reading the very same novel at that time, which was... Mm. Uh, Tom Robbins and other roadside attraction. And it was like that. We had the same interests, the same passions. We'd all, you know, the same music, the same anything. We could quote some obscure reference out of some book or Firesign Theater song or, or you know, thing or, or song or something. And we'd instantly pick it up because that's how it was with us. And one of the things that we had a shared passion was interest in mythical beasties. And when we started comparing notes on it, we thought, you know, it'd be really fun to write a book on the true stories behind the myths, because, you know, we figured every, you know, there's got to be like a grain of sand at the heart of a pearl somewhere. There's got to be an origin story for this myth. And we started collecting stuff on it and and going around and we started off. We just assumed as everybody did that the unicorn was just based on a misunderstanding of a rhinoceros, but that did not jive with all the pictures, you know, that we saw of them. They certainly didn't look very rhinocerous. You know, they all had cloven hooves and little bearded chins and tufted tails and flowing manes and, and these horns growing out of the center of their forehead. You know, and if you account for the different uh, art styles, the way people drew different kinds of critters, you could see, in fact, that they could be related to actual identifiable species. There were the, the most popular ones that we're familiar with, of course, from the uh, medieval and Renaissance era are, are caprine, their goat species that the bearded chin is the dead giveaway you know but mm-hmm. in other places and other times you see antelopine unicorns uh, in ancient persia the earliest ones we see are taurine bull unicorns usually shown fighting lions you know in china you've got the deer unicorn with a branching horn mm-hmm. um and, and 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 these appear too the more you get into this so we started doing research um in collecting stuff for our book we made folders of all kinds of different things. I've got big drawer full of folders on, on just everything. 
we'd go to libraries. There was no internet. There was no Google, you know, but we traveled and we'd go to universities and go to the libraries and, and we'd copy things out. They had copy machines, very crappy copy machines, but, you know, we, we had copies and filled folders and collected material. And in the process of that, somewhere in the late 70s um, at the University of Oregon, I came upon a research paper that had been done in the 1930s by a uh, veterinary doctor named Franklin Dove, who was also interested in unicorns. And he was doing experiments on horn growth and horn development in, in animals because the understanding that most people had of how horns develop was absolutely flat wrong. They really didn't get it. And he wanted to find out how they really developed. And he discovered that horns do not just grow out of the skull as they appear to do. They are stimulated to grow by little nodes that are embedded in the loose skin and inject enzymes a couple of days after birth. And those enzymes, where they're injected, stimulate the horn development completely. But it's all about the enzymes, and it's all about the little glands that have these. And so he said, hmm, what would happen if you move these around, if you shift the position? Will the horn grow wherever it, the enzymes grow? And he found that, in fact, it did. And so he did an experiment where he shifted the, the two buds, as it were, the little nodes, to the center of the forehead of a day-old Ayrshire bull calf. And the, all the enzymes came down in one spot and fused together. And a, a single horn grew perpendicularly from the center of the forehead. And he said, this has got to be the basis of the unicorn. And he described that in some detail in several papers that I got a hold of and read and said, holy shit, we could do this. And I talked to some friends about this. We were pretty excited. And one of our friends had some land up in the mountains in a hippie community in California. And she said, well, I could use a caretaker up on my property because I'm not going to go live there. But, you know, 220 acres, if you guys want to go up there and be my caretakers, you can hey, raise unicorns. What the hey? And that's exactly what we did. And we spent a couple of years selecting the right breeding stock and building the facilities and homesteading. And it was an amazing time. We lived up there for eight years in this incredible hippie community up in the mountains, 6,000 acres, about 100 families, founded in 1972, wow. one of the two oldest hippie communities in the world and still going strong, mm. called Field Ranch, the other one being the farm in Tennessee. Mm. And, um, and and we got the breeding stock and we got the first babies and we, uh, we, we did the little process that was involved in manipulating the horn tissue or the proto horn tissue. We didn't like transplant horns or anything. It was just simply manipulating loose skin so that it came of the center point. And the thing that's interesting is that when horns grow from the center of the uh, frontal bones and most animals except humans have divided frontal bones. We have only one. They, they, the skull has to thicken to support them. So it suppresses the frontal lobes of the brain as the horns grow and develop. The animals kind of get dumber and dumber. And the males are the ones that actually this works with because the females don't have the same kind of horn. But, it, but there's a place where six different bones grow together. There's the frontal bones, the supraorbital bones, the suborbital bones, and the nasal bones all come together at the point they call the third eye, right in the middle. And when the horn grows from that spot, it doesn't thicken the skull. In fact, what it does, it incorporates the, the bone tissue from all six of those bones, but it also takes the sinuses, which are behind it, grow up into it. So the horn is essentially hollow and honeycombed with sinus tissue, vastly increasing the sense of smell of the animal and giving it essentially an antenna out of the third eye, which is always in front of it. Because animals have two horns that grow back behind their head. They don't actually see their horns. But for a unicorn, that horn is sticking right out. And it becomes, as it grows, a weapon, an invincible weapon that they learn to use very, very effectively. And we learned through our study that unicorns originally developed to be able to defend the herd against predators, initially lions and later wolves. And they're depicted that way. They were, hor but you can only have one because if you get two of them, they will fight and, and kill each other. So we learned a lot. We learned that the myths are all true and it worked. And we had our first baby unicorns were born in the spring of 1980. And um, I told my father about this and he was in the card and gift shop company 
He had a big, he had actually the largest card and gift company in the country at that time, Treasure Masters. And I said, well, hey, Dad, you know, I talked to you about this unicorn thing. And, well, we got unicorns. And he said, what have you done? This, I, I, up until you told me, I've never even heard of a unicorn. I had no idea what you were talking about. But this year, I got the gift car, um, catalogs from all these different companies trying to promote, you know, this year's season of gift stuff. And they've all got unicorns, all of them, all feature <laughs> unicorns. I said, wow, I, um, I guess it must be the year of the unicorn. You know, and you know the thing is, the lesson I got from that is, is you may think you're doing the magic, but sometimes the magic is doing you, mm. because this was spontaneous. I'm sure these companies were not talking to each other either. They were all developing their own little thing, and somehow this synchronous coincidence, as Bob Wilson would have called it, you know, as in his Quincy dance, came together there. It was really quite profound. And so we t we said, well, what can we do with these? Well, we got to take them out in the world. Well, where are we going to take them out? Well, Renaissance fairs. That seemed like the obvious thing. So we started right. doing that, and including the Texas Renaissance Festival that you were at, and many others. And eventually, um, we got an agent booking us in the festivals. And eventually, um, he was able to get a booking with the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus for a four-year exhibition lease. And they took it and ran with it, and it became hugely famous enormously famous. We're on every TV show, newspapers, magazines, everywhere. It was huge. And amazingly enough, is 40 years later, the world is completely forgotten. That is, to me, the weirdest thing, is that something that spectacular could have disappeared from the collective memory. I was uh, I thinking the same thing as I was doing the research here. Like it, it, it had that flash in the pan when you were doing your thing, and then it just vanished again and there's a not to get into cosmic conspiracies but there's something very interesting about the way that just came and went and isn't it though that we can do this collective amnesia and how many other things that were once very famous and very well known and well established simply disappear from our collective consciousness you know i often give an example of robert green ingersoll the most famous individual of the 19th century very major figure, huge figure. There was nobody even comparable to him. And he, he wrote shelves of books and he was major political figure, major figure in the Civil War, you know, um, author, uh, all kinds of stuff, very big figure. And the world has completely forgotten he ever existed. His funeral had the largest turnout of any funeral recorded up to that time. He was close friends with Mark Twain. He was the he did stump speeches for all presidential candidates from Lincoln on. He was a very major figure, Robert Greene Ingersoll. Mm. If you look him up, there's you can find reams of quotes. He was just tremendous, and, and nobody remembers him. He's he's totally forgotten. Yeah, uh, the name the name rings a bell, and I couldn't tell you a thing about him. And so that happens that way. You know, things can become very big, very famous, very well known, and you think that's it. They're established. You know. You know, we, we thought that over 50 years ago, we'd established women's right to determine whether to have babies or not. You know, we figured that was a done deal, you know. And then suddenly it's not. What the hell? You know? Boy, yeah, that's a whole nother topic. Yeah, but you get the idea. I mean, just just going back to the unicorns, it, I mean, it's it's the real deal that you created there. I first heard about it read about it and i thought well you know what this sounds cute but but that's a serious horn that, no, it's, that... it's it's quite real this is the authentic genuine unicorn totally documented totally recorded you know everything we had to prove all that stuff to get the contract with the circus we have yeah. reams of stuff on it it's written up in the encyclopedia britannica you know i mean it was a big deal yeah, I'm still stuck on that. It is mind-boggling how it just just vanished and hasn't really been. You'd you'd think that's the kind of thing that people would take and run with. And um, wow. Well, um, Oberon, it's been a, a a joy and a pleasure chatting with you. Is, is are there any current projects you're working on you'd like to hit us up with, or what's what's uh, new in your life today? Well, um. Obviously, I, I do want to promote my book. Everybody should go out and read this. I think this is the most important book I've ever written, and I've written a bunch of them. I'm working on right now on one called History's Mysteries, and I'm also working on um, 
one called Handbook for My Future Parents. That's sort of like, next time around, this is how I want you to raise me. And that mm. would apply to anybody. Think about that. If you could give a message to your future parents, tell them what, you, what you've learned, what you'd like to know. What would that look like? So I've been collecting stories from people about that in essays and material and writing about that whole thing. So that's one. And I got another one kind of on the back burner that's a wizard's guide to witchy women that um, will have a lot of what I've learned about women. And it will have lots of women contributing to that on, on what guys need to know about dealing with women. Uh, those are a few. I've got others. I've got uh, journals of my travels. I have just, just a lot of stuff. I, I, my intention is to keep living long enough. But the big thing, of course, in my life is that I am now engaged to an amazing, wonderful woman, a, a, a priestess and a pagan and an incredible woman named Rhiannon. And I'm very excited about that. Oh, let me, let me just briefly duck out and show you something. We uh, took a trip together with her daughter to, um, uh, to the east for Fourth of July week. And we went to Williamsburg and we went to Bush Gardens and we went to the Smithsonian and we went to, um, to see the Fourth of July fireworks at the Capitol and on the steps of the Washington Monument, looking over the reflecting pool with the um, uh, Washington Monument. I mean, saw on the step of the Lincoln Memorial with the Washington Monument. And that's where I made my proposal. Oh. And here's a picture of me. Just as the fireworks went off, making my proposal to my beloved. Nice. Yeah. That was pretty good. That was a pretty good legendary occasion. I, so, I was going to say, that's quite the way to uh, see fireworks on the 4th of July. And then you sprung the engagement proposal on top of that. That's. Uh, I was rather tickled about that whole thing, the way it came together. So, So that's that. And so that's a big part of my life. And we're in the process of getting a new home together. Um, so I'm, I'm presently living at her place, but we're we're looking at getting a place big enough to really make that a new thing and expect to be doing a lot of good stuff there, including a, a new headquarters for Church of All Worlds and all kinds of exciting stuff. Oh, wow. So I've got books to write on, a new relationship to build, a community to be a part of. Um, I'm busy. I'm 80 years old now, so, you know, I got to start doing some stuff. <laughs> it's time for you to get off get right. up off the couch right <laughs> well uh, wow that um congratulations on your engagement it's good to hear you're staying busy but it's just amazing to hear how uh much you've done and how you continue to work i i find that very inspiring i don't even know what, i'm speechless well thank you get back from the a week in chicago at the parliament of the world's religions and I've got a full schedule of bookings at um, events of various sorts, a couple of pagan pride events and a Bigfoot festival that I've got booked into to give talks and have booths at and sell my stuff. And yeah, I keep pretty busy. Wow. Okay. Um, keep on keeping on. Uh, and thank you for, for taking the time to chat. Been delightful to be here. Thank you for having me, Mike. Uh, my pleasure. That concludes the episode. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. A big thank you to Oberon Zell Ravenheart for taking the time to chat. Thank you, as always, to Christina Pearson of the Robert Anton Wilson Trust and Richard Rasa of Hilaritas Press. And a special thank you to Rasa for helping engineer and produce today's episode. My next guest, Wayne Solomon, will appear on the 23rd of November. Until then, I'm your host, Mike Gathers, signing off with love and cheerfulness. Amor e hilaritas.